Hello. Charlotte Lawrence, surgical nurse, was having an interview with the chief of staff of the hospital. She wasn't being put on the carpet by him. She'd gone to his office voluntarily to unburden her soul. You were my father's closest friend, sir. And I hope I'm one of your closest friends, too, Charlotte. Yes, you are. Well, then, what's your problem today? I... I guess you know. Why do women torture themselves by going into professions that tear their hearts into bits and pieces? Well, that's a question I can't answer, Shona. It's hard enough to be just any nurse, but so much depends on a surgical nurse. But you're not one to shirk responsibility, Charlotte? I'm overtired. Not that it's any excuse. I, I've been working too long and too hard without a vacation. I, I was so tired I couldn't sleep last night. I was full of jitters when I went into the operating room and... When the patient died on the table. Charlotte, it wasn't your fault. He had one chance in a million of pulling through. I always feel that he would have lived if I hadn't forgotten to put that scalpel on the tray. It was as much the surgeon's fault as yours, Charlotte. He should have checked over the tray before he started the operation. I've assisted him so often he didn't feel he had to check. Well, not that it's any excuse, but... But there in the operating room at that terribly tense moment when Dr. Powers reached for the scalpel and hesitated because it wasn't there... I... I touched bottom. If I know powers, he hesitated for only a fraction of a second. A fraction of a second didn't make any difference, and you know it. It couldn't have made any difference. But perhaps it did. You know yourself that there's a certain rhythm to an operation. I... Don't try to comfort me, sir. It won't do any good. I'm beyond comfort. I'm through, sir. You mean... I mean I'm quitting my job making this mistake, well, I'm through, that's all. Through with messy operations, with walking down endless corridors with blood and tears. I've, I've saved quite a bit of money for a rainy day. Well, now I'm going to spend it like a drunken sailor. I'm going to pretend that I'm a social butterfly. I'm going to hunt for a husband who's a solid businessman who knows but nothing about hospitals and instrument plays and missing scalpels. I'm, I'm sure the supervisor will see it my way. She was probably all set to fire me anyhow. I, I'm only jumping the gun. Well, I'm not going to accept your verdict just yet, Charlotte. Now, you'll take a leave of absence for one month, two months or three months if necessary, and come back rested and relaxed, oh, and then... I'll never come back. I've stopped being a nurse as of now. It's hateful to be a legalized murderer. Oh, there, there, Charlotte. Why, I've known you since you were a little girl, since you bandaged dolls and tin soldiers. Being a nurse is the biggest part of your life, a part of your life that you can't just give up. Now, look, child, don't go back into the hospital proper. I'll let you out of my side door. It opens onto the street, and, well... I'll have a talk with the supervisor myself. You're too good to me. You're too good to be chief of staff of, of a hospital. Goodbye, sir. And thanks. Maybe I'm a hysterical fool. But... I'd never call you a hysterical fool, Charlotte, but something must be wrong. You wouldn't be talking to yourself. Oh, Drummond, I've only seen you two or three times since we graduated from high school. What are you doing away from your office? I'm mad at my boss. I had to get away from the office before I slapped him down. How about a cup of tea somewhere, Charlotte? Oh, all right. Oh, there's a little place down the street. If you were so tired that you couldn't see straight, Olive, where would you go for a vacation? To Sea Island. That's off the coast of Georgia. You get to the island over a causeway. I went there on my vacation two years ago, and I loved it. Wonderful swimming, golf, tennis, dancing, and lots of men. Oh, that's for me. 
I want to lie on a beach in an excuse for a bathing suit and get brown practically all over. I want to dance and play golf and flirt. I always thought you were too consecrated to be true. I'll tell you all about Sea Island when we reach the tea shop. In just a moment, Hope Winslow will be back. But first... Once the bugle was vital to the functioning of an army, its loud, clear voice giving musical orders could be heard above the din of battle. It could lift the morale of troops at critical moments. It literally dominated the lives of soldiers and sailors, from reveille to the bittersweet tap. Early bugles were made from wild ox horns, and the Roman term for the instrument came from their word for ox, boss. The word buculus, meaning a young steer, was also in use. And from this, the French derived the term bugle horn. And finally, when the great musician Joseph Haydn wrote the first modern bugle calls in 1793, it was bugle. Even with modern systems of communication, the bugle is still with us, important for ceremonies. When you next hear taps, Think back with pride to a heroic young Roland of Charlemagne's days, blowing his own taps on the field of battle. In this complex world, where word meanings are constantly changing, it's easy to be misunderstood. That's why it's a good idea to know your words. Back to our story with Hope Winslow. So Charlotte Lawrence, following her own prescription, dipped recklessly into her savings and bought clothes that were utterly unreminiscent of clinics or wards or operating rooms and took a plane to Sea Island, Georgia. And when she'd been there for a week and was almost completely tanned, she raced into the sea one day and a wave caught her unaware and threw her into a pair of arms and she tilted her head back and glanced up and... Well, well, well. A gift from the sea, and what a gift. Uh, why, why, I know you, lady. I met you last winter. Where? In a hospital on Upper Fifth Avenue. I dropped in to bring some flowers to a maiden aunt, and you were looking over her chart. Uh, my name's Barry Goodwin, and yours is... Now, uh, wait a minute, don't tell me. I'll remember it's Lawrence, right? Right. Charlotte Lawrence. You know, I noticed your lashes when you studied the chart. I noticed a funny little dimple you have high on your cheekbone, and I noticed your hands. I called the hospital a couple of times, but you were always out or busy, so like a dope, I gave up. I, uh, I wouldn't have given up so easily if I had seen you in a bathing suit. Come, come, Mr. Goodwin, you're fitting. About the bathing suit? About calling the hospital. I never received your message. Well, I didn't leave my name. It wouldn't have meant anything to you. Tell me, when you, uh... Will you be in Sea Island long? Mm, for some time. Wonderful. I'm here for a month. This is my first day. I've had a touch of overwork, and the doctor suggested a long vacation. The nurse thinks you look very sick. Well, I'm feeling better every minute. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back in the ocean, shall we? And after we've had our swim, we can start to make plans. Plans? What sort of plans? Oh, we'll figure out what we're going to do tomorrow, and what we're going to do the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and... Uh, I didn't find item. <laughs> you seem to be taking over, Mr. Goodwin. I am. For a whole long, lovely month. You are lovely. I can't imagine you doing the horrible things that nurses have to do. You're not the type. I'm beginning to think you're right. Why did you decide to be a nurse in the first place? I can't help being curious. My great-grandfather was a doctor. My grandfather was also a doctor. And my father followed suit. Daddy never had a son, so... I carried on after a fashion. So that's it, huh? Yes, that's it. I bandaged dolls and kept my tin soldiers in bed for days before I was sick. Lucky dolls. And double lucky tin, show, tin soldiers. <laughs> Too bad they were tin. Now tell me, didn't you ever have any other burning ambition? Not until recently. How recently? I had a dreadful experience in the hospital. It made me do a, a right about face. We won't discuss it. No. No, we won't. But I was hoping you'd say that a big bad wave changed the 
course of their life. Delightful days, dream swept nights beneath the moon. Once Charlotte's feet had been tired from walking a hospital corridor. Now they were tired from dancing. She knew that Barry Goodwin loved her even before he proposed, and he proposed at the end of the second week. She wondered if she were in love with him. And then one day, Barry suggested a picnic. Darling, I'm tired of polished up beaches and French food. Let, now let's find ourselves an isolated spot on the mainland. Something that isn't a bit resortish. Can you cook, Charlotte? That I can. Do you broil a mean shop? But yes, the meaner the better. No, 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 no. On, on second thought, it's too warm for a fire. And we'd have, we'll have scared the time to work out a domestic routine. <laughs> Besides, we'll always have plenty of, plenty of servants. Oh. <laughs> They'll pack a hamper at the hotel, and the only hot thing will be coffee. And that'll be in a thermos, Barbara. Well, I'm the lazy type. Uh, I'll get out a, la a road map and study it. Just as long as I'm far from human habitation with you, I'm satisfied. I'll pick up a book of poetry before tomorrow. Huh? A book of verses underneath the bow. A loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou beside me singing. Was it singing? In the wilderness. You can hold down the singing on us for the both of us. <laughs> Darling, I think it'll be fun. But everything's fun with you. Everything's fun with you. Sometimes I... I pinch myself to be sure that I'm awake, Barry. Life used to be so grim and earnest. So unfunny. Mm, I enjoy being a butterfly. I was thinking the other day that my cocoon was a white uniform, a cap, and a pair of rubber gloves. But now I've emerged. Yes, you have. You are the most beautiful butterfly on earth. Are in the heavens above the earth. They started out rather early in the morning. They crossed the causeway to the mainland. They ignored the well-marked highways and chose instead practically unmarked byways. They joked and laughed about nothing at all. And then, all at once, Barry was deadly serious. You've done a lot of flirting, Charlotte, and I've done a lot of kidding, but I'm going to say something that I want you to remember. There are only two women I've ever given a hang about. The first was my mother. She died when I was 16. And you're the second, darling. I'm flattered, Barry. I'm deeply touched. <laughs> I feel as if a violin should be playing hearts and flowers in the background. But I happen to mean every word I just said. I know you do. Now that I've found you. Well, if we happen to break up, it would be the absolute end. I, I don't know that I'd survive the shock, and I'm not sure Barry, that take I... Take it easy, for heaven's sake, take it easy! Oh! Happens to good breaks. Well, amen to that. Well, the man who has his head stuck under the hood doesn't know how close he came. You might as well say it right out, Charlotte, to death. Oh. He's pulling his head out now like an oversized snapping turtle. <laughs> but he doesn't look like a turtle. Well, why did you have to break down on the far side of a curve, mister? It was almost a nasty accident, brother. Well, I didn't hear the car. I was absorbed in what I was doing. <laughs> that's obvious. Shall I send somebody uh, on from the next garage? Well, that's just the trouble, isn't it, in the next garage? But I'll be awfully obliged if you give me a lift. I'm going to a cabin about five miles from here. I'm in a desperate hurry. It's an emergency. Well, we are going nowhere in particular, and we're in no hurry at all, so uh, hop in. Oh, well, listen, just wait half a sec, will you, till I get my bag? There we are. You're being more than kind. Well, that looks like a doctor's bag. Uh-huh, it is. Well, well, the long arm of coincidence, yes? Well, move over, Charlotte. We, we all three can sit in the front seat. Okay, Doc? Right. My name's Lee Brennan. Oh, I'm uh, Barry Goodwin. This is Charlotte Lawrence. How do you do? Uh, you'll have to direct us, Doctor. Oh, well, we go straight along this road for about uh, three and a half miles, and then we turn off to a dirt road. 
<clears throat> See, I was out when the call came. You said an emergency? Uh-huh. It's one of a series of emergencies. This patient of mine has a desperate problem. Oh. But frankly, I'm beginning to think I have this thing licked. At least I'd have it licked if I could provide a capable nurse who could be trusted implicitly. Is there anyone who can be trusted implicitly? I didn't get that. Oh, oh it was unimportant. You you said a, a desperate problem? Yeah. Of course, it's hard working alone without hospital facilities. But can't be happy. I'm only a country doctor. Just one step removed from the horse and buggy boys. Oh, sometimes the country doctors contribute more than the high-powered city doctors. Is your patient in pain? Yeah, most of the time. I I don't want to seem curious, but what is this problem? Now, don't get morbid, darling. You're a butterfly, remember? Oh, yes, I'm a butterfly, and I do remember. And I'm going to continue to be a butterfly for the rest of my life. Amen to that. But Dr. Brennan has said a couple of things that intrigued me. A fire horse, even when he's been put out to pasture, lifts his head and listens when a siren sounds. In just a moment, Hope Winslow will be back. The insignia of the armed forces of the United States of America have a fascinating history of development. They are colorful, purposive, and they are many. Their historical foundations go back into the history of mankind itself. Those things which man regards with awe, with reverence, and with interest become part of his symbolistic heritage. The silver Latin cross of the Christian chaplains was adopted in 1898 from the wooden cross of Jesus. The mosaic tablet surmounted by the Star of David was adopted for the Jewish chaplains in 1918. By 1902, the medical corps had decided on the caduceus as its symbol. It is a form of the staff of the ancient Greek god of medicine, Esculapius. The nurse corps followed this example, but added a capital N. In 1868, the Signal Corps took for its insignia crossed signal flags. Later, added a torch. In 1875, the present cross rifles insignia was adopted for the infantry. Before that date, its badge was a bugle, originating from the days of Robin Hood. But whatever the insignia, great is the pride of the American servicemen who wear them. to our story with Hope Winslow. It was almost twilight when they drove back across the causeway to Sea Island, where the beaches were polished and the food had its French accent. Charlotte was white and tired beneath her coat of tan. Barry parked his car expertly, and then, only then, did he say what was in his mind. You're a wreck, Charlotte. Well, not exactly. We've danced the dawn in a couple of times, but I've never known you to be so tired. No, you haven't. Oh, I'm a fool. I planned a picnic, and look what happened to the darn thing. Why did we have to take that special road that led to Lee Brennan's car, and why did we offer him a lift? We didn't offer him a lift. He asked for a lift, and we couldn't very well refuse him. Oh, I suppose not. Oh, I'm but... sorry, Barry. Terribly sorry. And so you should be. Is Brennan going to spend the night with his patient? Yes. Well, what about his other patients? Isn't it rather whimsical of him to neglect a whole gang of patients for just one patient? Whimsical? No, he isn't in the least whimsical. And then, too, he hasn't anything especially serious on the books right now. Except... Except... Except that woman. Yes. That woman. Why would a talented doctor want to bury himself in the backwoods of Georgia? He was born and brought up here. He, he knew that the need was great. Of course, he didn't realize that such an obscure ailment would come his way. Well, I had one look at the patient. She was hardly human. She reached the end of it. She'd be done with it. She'd probably be glad to die. She'd probably be glad to live, Barry. Well, I have an idea she'll pass out tonight. She won't. Well, how can you say that? Because I know. Lee has the case under control at the moment. And if I could be with her day and night, nursing her and taking notes, he'd have it under control permanently. Lee? 
When you've worked with a man for six hours the way I worked with Lee, you shed last names. Yeah. That isn't all you shed. What do you mean? Well, I was thinking of butterfly wings. Yours are a bit crumpled, you know. I'm afraid so. <laughs> isn't it lucky you brought that picnic hamper, Barry? We'd have starved to death. Yeah, we ate the loaf of bread, but... Omar Khayyam, be darned. We didn't open the book of verse, and there wasn't time for a jug of wine. Or the heart. And the wilderness was far from being a paradise for two. I had a swell day sitting on our porch smoking while you and an attractive doctor... I hadn't realized that Lee was attractive. I only realized that he was a brilliant doctor. A brilliant doctor. It's a small world, isn't it, Barry? Too small. Despite Dr. Brennan's genius and despite your capable nursing, he, uh, he may lose the patient anyhow. Yes, he may. But at least he's writing a new chapter in medical history. Oh, I'd like to drag him up north to my hospital and work with him. Or stay down here and work for him. We have so many of the same ideas. We'd make a swell team. So it seems. Well, I think I've recovered from my attack of overwork, Charlotte. Recovered completely. Will you miss me if I go back to New York tomorrow? Yesterday, Barry, I... I'm being honest. I, I would have missed you terribly. But today... I just don't know. Only time will tell. Everybody else or everything else will tell, given a chance. But time often keeps its secrets to the bitter end. When Charlotte Lawrence came out of the hospital and stood waiting for a cab, she heard a familiar voice and glanced around to face Olive Drummond, the girl who'd been in her class at school. Since Olive now held a secretarial job, it was surprising to find her away from the office at that time of the day. Winslow will tell you more about Olive Drummond. If you remember the incident, Olive explained her absence from the office by saying, I'm mad at my boss and I had to get away from the office before I slapped him down. Perhaps Olive Drummond had good reason to be mad at her boss. You can judge for yourself when I bring you Olive's story. Until then, this is Hope Winslow saying goodbye from the Whispering Street. Today's program was written by Margaret E. Sankster. Featured in the cast were Janet Waldo, Jack Edwards, Clark Gordon, and Eve McVeigh. Whispering Streets was directed by Gordon T. Hughes and produced by Ted Lloyd. Your announcer is Dan Coverley. Whispering Streets has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.